Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 34th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting Series. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us this morning for the first time. And I know we've got a good few of our regulars joining us. So, so welcome back to uh, this morning's event. Uh, I'm just going to quickly run through some slides here and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Um, for anybody who has not joined us before, um, we tend to have companies on here that, that fit the, the following criteria. So when I say microcap, we're talking about companies under 300 million in market capitalization and uh, all our companies are in revenue and generally approaching cash flow break even are already profitable. We don't have companies from either the resources sector or the biotech sector. So we like to say that we have what we would call uh, industrial microcaps, which basically covers uh, most of the other sectors that you'll find uh, on the ASX. Uh, the structure of this morning's webinar, um, it's one hour where we have two companies broken down into uh, 30 minutes for each, uh, 20 minute prezzo, 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, if you do have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. Just makes it easier to moderate the Q&A session when we get there. Please note that the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, tomorrow morning. So if a presenter skips over a particular slide or you can't stay for the whole presentation, you can watch it back tomorrow morning. And indeed, all of our previous presentations that we've had in this series so far. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, uh, YouTube for this recording and, and all previous uh, meetings, LinkedIn, I do some additional long form content on there. I also write a weekly paid newsletter where I profile one ASX microcap stock every week and you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. Our first presenter up this morning will be Mark Duher joining us from Adelaide with Aerometrics uh, and then we're going to skip across the Nullabor to Perth uh, and Dan Madden is going to be joining us from Joyce Corporation. So without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And I know Mark is waiting in the wings. So Mark, if you want to start sharing your screen. There we go. Uh, it's just coming through now. And just if you can go to full screen mode, please, Mark. Just so we... Sorry. Uh, can you see that full screen? Yeah, you're still not in. Uh, it's oh, wait now. That's all right now. Now you're in full screen mode now, Mark. OK, great. OK, well, thank you, Mark. And uh, good morning, everybody. So you know, I'm pleased to uh, present a little bit about aerometrics this morning. Uh, I know that many of you uh, may be new to the story, so I'll spend a little time just going through uh, the history of the company and so forth. Um, and Aerometrics is a geospatial technology company. Um, we used to call that aerial photography and mapping, I guess, but uh, the, the scope of activities has broadened considerably from our original core business. Uh, we are still in aerial photography and mapping. Uh, we also uh, provide laser mapping services, LIDAR uh, from aeroplanes, and we provide uh, 3D modeling services as well, and that is the construction of digital twins uh, and, and virtual reality type environments. Um, we also have uh, a, a subscription service called Metro Map that offers aerial photography and 3D uh, modeling products to a subscriber base. Aerometrics has been around for a long time, initially established in 1980. Uh, a number of significant events in the company's history. I guess 2011 was a management buyout uh, by the staff and management from the previous owner. Uh, 2015, we acquired the LiDAR firm Atlas Australia and, and added that capability to our uh, stable of offerings. Uh, we listed on the uh, stock exchange, the ASX, in uh, December 2019, following the raising of a, a pre IPO convertible note in, in June 2019. Uh, and uh, I guess um, 
yeah, we've carried on since then. We established our US office uh, to specifically to market our 3D technology to a much larger market there. We also acquired one of our uh, competitors in the subscription space, uh, Spookfish Australia in 2020. So the company has grown considerably uh, over the last uh, 10 years, but in the last two years in, in particular, um, I guess our, our business models can be broken down into those two categories. We have a, our subscription service, MetroMap, uh, as I explained. So a DAS offering, data as a service offering. Uh, basically, our subscribers can get onto our web browser platform and, and look at any capital city uh, throughout Australia. We update the coverages four times a year. Uh, and a number of rural and regional centres that we're doing it uh, annually as well. So uh, there's quite a, uh, a database there that people can use to do simple things like uh, measurement, uh, but also, you know, the, the uh, qualitative analysis of looking to see what is there at that particular location. And I guess fundamentally, that's what geospatial technology is all about. What is there uh, answers that question. Um, so, so uh, the other side of the, the coin is our project work where we offer LIDAR as a project uh, type um, contract basis. That, uh, that sort of activity is, is concentrated or was concentrated very heavily in the resources sector. So we were doing things like pit volumes and stockpiles and so forth for mines. We have broadened that, uh, that capability and that service considerably. And we're now in uh, environments and forestry, uh, agriculture, um, coastal erosion, and a whole number of other things in uh, construction and, uh, and infrastructure developments as well. Um, so uh, aerial photography, our traditional service, we're conducted on a project basis uh, and our 3D offering. Uh, We'll go through each one of those in more detail in a minute. We've just put the total addressable uh, market for each one of those uh, aspects of our business on the bottom line there, on the bottom half of the screen. And you can see that um, uh, in Australia, for, for example, for our subscription model, uh, we see a total addressable market there of about $80 million. And we at the moment have about 4.26 million of that. There is an incumbent in that market. Uh, we are grabbing market share uh, quite rapidly and, you know, we think that there is room for two players in that market. So, uh, you know, we're quite uh, optimistic and we think we've got plenty of headroom to, to build that subscriber base uh, further. Uh, in project work, um, we assess the LIDAR market in Australia as having about a 50 million per annum um, TAM and uh, at the moment, running at about 8.9 to 9 uh, mil uh, per annum. So yeah, there's still a fair bit of, of room to go. Again, in that market, there is an incumbent. And again, we're taking market share quite strongly uh, from, from them. So that's a, a, a part of the business that's growing very strongly and has responded very well to injections of capital uh, in terms of upgrading sensors and, um, and getting more resources in terms of aircraft. Aerial photography, we're the dominant player in that market in Australia. Uh, it, is a, it is a market that is slowly contracting. However, uh, the subscription model is certainly um, taking over from a lot of the uh, project type applications that we used to do. And a lot of our customers now are uh, either uh, finding uh, applications for what they want to do in LiDAR or in 3D or in MetroMap. So yeah, we are seeing a slow leakage, I guess, out of the aerial photography project market, uh, but still um, useful re revenue earner there. Uh, 3D is, uh, is something that we have not been game to put a, a TAM, a total addressable market figure on. We see global uh, application for that technology. Uh, we can take the service that we provide in 3D anywhere in the world, or we could have before COVID. I think post-COVID, uh, yeah, we hope to be uh, traveling a lot more to, to do international projects. We have performed projects pre-COVID in, in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and 
we do see a, a general industry migration from, uh, from 2D type mapping applications towards 3D. It'll happen over a period of time. Um, the computer technology now allows for that sort of uh, transition and people take the 3D extremely readily. They see it as very intuitive uh, and easy to understand. Um, there's a fair bit of text on this slide. So we could talk about the industries uh, that we service. So there are about 18 different industries that we work with and uh, they're listed at the top there. Uh, we have a very broad client base um, and not all of our um, revenues are concentrated in one particular sector, which is something that we like very much. Uh, so if one is down, the, the others normally pick up the slack. The use cases for each one of the, uh, the aspects of our service are listed down below there. Uh, and look, I won't go through them all at the moment in the interest of time, but uh, I'm sure the slide will be available um, through copy microcaps or uh, presentations on YouTube or also uh, through the ASX, where you can find that in our, um, in our ASX releases. So just to show uh, the breakdown in, in, uh, in graphical form, uh, the top two uh, pie charts show the current year. So in terms of the uh, industry breakdown, mining 37%, government of all types 25%, uh, utilities and infrastructure 17, oil and gas, water, and then uh, the others there. Uh, in terms of client type, uh, traditionally we had a sort of 50-50 breakdown between government and private sector. And we're finding that the pendulum is actually swinging considerably towards the private company uh, market. So 78% um, is, is, uh, is untypically high. And uh, it's actually, I think, a thing that we're, um, we're finding is, is quite a good thing, in fact. And you can see the previous uh, breakdowns uh, in the bottom two figures. Uh, key financials. So uh, the company is, is tracking quite well in terms of group revenue. We did have a hiccup in the first half of FY21 due to, uh, I guess, some conservatism amongst our project client base. However, during that time, our subscription revenues grew strongly. And uh, I think that reflected the fact that a lot of people were working from home and needed to access digital services online, which they could do quite happily through MetroMap not quite so easy in our project environment. We also found that some of our project customers were a little um, less uh, ready to spend their budgets uh, in that first part of the year, but um, yeah, things have, have picked up considerably in the second half. Uh, so still have cash at bank of 16.3 million after raising 25 million in, in uh, December, 2019. We have been using the cash, but we've been replenishing it from our project uh, and, and core business type activities. So um, yeah, the, the, the runway is, is quite long considering the fact that we, uh, that we started with 25 and we still got 16 uh, mil there in, in cash. The geographical segments, Australia and the US are the two areas we focused on. Uh, our main office is here in Adelaide. We also have an office on the Sunshine Coast, which is the headquarters of our LiDAR operation. And uh, we have an office in Denver, Colorado as well, where we've taken our 3D uh, product. And uh, we see um, you know, a great deal of potential in that market. Uh, hasn't been realized yet, but um, yeah, COVID has slowed us up a little bit there. But uh, yeah, we're, we're talking to the right sort of people over in that market and we're confident of uh, good things ahead. Uh, Metro Map annual recurring revenue, uh, as you can see, very strong growth since um, December uh, 2019 when we listed. Um, the, uh, there is an aspect of uh, subscription services that you actually have to invest a lot of money in the capture of data sets, which uh, provide the sort of coverage and the, the database that is uh, acceptable to a, a subscriber base. Um, so you have to get over that hump of doing all the captures, all the, all the flying and the photography processing and so forth. And then, uh, and then yeah, the subscribers are keen to get on board once they see uh, the evidence of that coverage. But very good uh, growth there, up 398% on Q3 FY20. 
Um, so yeah, that's the sort of trend we're after. Uh, again, uh, I've been through some of this uh, material, but uh, again, there's more uh, examples there of major use cases and so forth. We've done particularly well in the architecture, engineering, and construction space. And I think there is a reason for that. The company has a very long and proud history in delivering mapping services to government and to the largest corporations in the world, including Google and Microsoft. Uh, we have a reputation for accuracy and uh, that is second to none, basically. So the engineers and construction industry in particular needs that accuracy when they start uh, using our imagery and they need to relate it to their other data sets. So that's an, a vital point, I guess, in terms of our appeal uh, to a sophisticated subscriber market. But we also want to target, apart from the geospatial market, the other side of the the market which we see as the corporate sector that's people like banks and insurance companies and uh, property managers and pool guys and all that sort of thing so the sme market as well and some of those might be more interested in just seeing the qualitative image you know uh, they, is there a tree there um, is there access to this uh, point of the house or whatever so um, yeah we aim to cover both of those sides of the market with the one product it's just another slide there um, showing the uh, continued growth of the, the business. Uh, we integrated Spookfish uh, Australia into Metro Map in, in uh, 2020, and uh, that doubled our data archive overnight. Uh, it was a very good acquisition for us, and we brought along a lot of their customers uh, as well. So it's contributed um, something like a million dollars worth of, uh, of revenue into the Metro Map program. Um, and a lot of those customers have uh, renewed their, their contracts now. We also have uh, developed uh, MetroCam, which is our own uh, aerial camera system. Uh, aerial cameras are very expensive uh, bits of kit. They typically cost one and a half million dollars each. They're enormous cameras. Uh, and we've decided to go down the path of developing our own camera solution. Um, we brought our camera design to uh, production in less than 12 months, which is a huge effort. And uh, that is in production now and capturing very high quality imagery from uh, very high altitude. And uh, yeah, we're extremely pleased with, uh, with that development. Also, we have our Metro Map platform offering. So it's a web browser uh, and uh, web browser type system, but you can also uh, use uh, an API link to stream the Metro map data into desktop mapping type systems, GIS systems as well. Um, I guess this is all about um, simplifying uh, spatial insights for our business users, allowing, giving them access to the information that they need. Um, we don't aim to be, uh, you know, to concentrate on one particular proprietary solution. We aim to service all the types of software systems that are out there. Um, we aim to make it very simple for our customers in terms of data management. They don't have to manage the data. They can, uh, they can rely on us to deliver uh, the data that they need, um, more or less in, in, uh, at the instant they need it. Um, simplifying tools and workflows, you know, doing things like uh, measurement, uh, comparative analysis, um, looking from through all the uh, historic data that we have is as simple as just lining up two dates and doing a swipe comparison between the two. Um, we're also investing very heavily into, into deriving information analytics from the imagery that people can use to solve their particular practical uh, solution. So um, AI is, is a very fertile ground for research and development. The, the speed of the answers that we are able to develop over just enormous data sets, uh, that speed is astounding. You know, it's, we're doing things in 48 hours that would have taken months and months to do uh, by any other method. So yeah, that, that's a very interesting area. And uh, one where we're able to tailor solutions to specific types of customers. Um, so, yeah, to, to, to meet their exact needs. 
And we have diversified data sources. So we're talking about not only imagery, uh, but also LIDAR and 3D models. Uh, we can utilize satellite imagery as well in specific instances. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole range of data types that we can use. There's a shot there of um, our 3D offering inside the Metro map uh, web browser interface. So very intuitive, very comprehensive, very high resolution data. Um, nice segue into 3D. So uh, the graphic on the right is actually a, a job that we did in, the, in Southern France. It's the city of Pau. Uh, they did a worldwide competitive tender, which Aerometrics won. And um, yeah, we went over to Pau and captured their whole uh, city uh, in, in very high resolution 3D, even to the point of doing street level imagery and produced virtually a digital twin of uh, the old city of Po that you can walk through in, in augmented reality or virtual reality. Uh, you can walk down streets, uh, look inside, uh, shop windows, read restaurant menus, it is amazing. Uh, and Aerometrics is really leading the way worldwide with this technology. We, uh, we started working with 3D in 2012. We were way ahead of the, of the game, really. Uh, but we've continued to develop our capabilities to the point now that we are a recognized uh, world leader. So um, 3D models provide uh, just great context for any sort of maintenance or development type activity or engineering type activity, a tourism application. Um, you know, for engineering planning or design. So there's lots and lots of uh, applications for it. Even things like computer games and, and uh, virtual reality type applications. Um, we, we do provide our 3D solutions at a range of resolutions. When I talk about resolutions, I'm talking pixel size. That's the picture elements on the ground. Um, so you will be familiar with the concept of pixels from your digital cameras, but uh, the pixel size, what that represents on the ground determines the resolution or the degree of detail that you can see in the 3D model. So we're offering even our, our 7.5 centimeter resolution product is, is a cut above what else is being offered in the market, but we can also go to five uh, centimeters and two centimeters, which we capture from helicopter platforms and even down to street level, we can incorporate all of those products into the same model. Um, it's actually a fairly light uh, capital investment activity. We, we don't have to buy aircraft or we don't have to buy very expensive cameras to do this work. And it's a, therefore it's a uh, service that is scalable and, uh, and applicable uh, everywhere in the world pretty much. Um, so 3D modeling, um, I'm going to skip over this because I can see we're running out of time fast. That's another illustration from the city of Poe. Uh, LiDAR is, uh, has a huge number of applications. And again, I'll skip through this. The great advantage is to look through vegetation to see the, the uh, ground surface below, uh, below the vegetation canopy growing strongly and uh, you know, there is the potential for us to develop uh, and to sell uh, a sales channel um, for our LiDAR data through MetroMap as well. Aerial photography and mapping is already covered. Uh, research and development, particularly focusing at the moment on machine learning, artificial intelligence, the ability to train uh, data sets to recognize particular features such as the swimming pool example there. And we've developed very clever techniques to enable us to train artificial intelligence algorithms to do this uh, very quickly. We have a number of growth initiatives. We are focusing very heavily on MetroMap, continuing to build momentum there in our subscription revenue. Um, and 3D modeling, talking to the large, largest global companies in the US in respect of their 3D opportunities. Um, and yeah, there, there are many. Uh, research and development, uh, we're leveraging opportunities in AI and machine learning there and things like bushfire fuel load modeling as well, which is an application that uh, has started to really grab some attention amongst the, 
um, the CFS, RFS type communities. Um, our growth slide um, pretty much talks about that as well. And so just to uh, finish up our DAS subscription model uh, is probably our key focus, world leaders in 3D modeling. Uh, the market opportunities are there with plenty of headroom, but an established business that is well placed to take advantage of it. We have a very experienced, innovative staff and our reputation is second to none in the industry. I encourage you to look at the videos. Uh, they are very instructive and it's, it's a really good way to see the sophistication of the products that we're turning up at this point. So I'll leave it there and perhaps uh, Mark has, uh, has got some questions already on the Q&A tab. Uh, we do, Mark. I think uh, let's tackle this first one. Um, what's the connection with Eagle View? Because most people will be aware that Eagle View, you know, took out Spookfish when it was listed. Whenever that, I think that was like back 2017, 2018, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Maybe just yeah. clarify, you know, what has gone on since Eagle View did that buyout and how you acquired the assets of Spookfish Australia. Yeah, okay. So Eagle View owned uh, the assets of Spookfish Australia. It was really the camera technology that had been developed by Spookfish that they were after. Uh, and they were continuing to provide a, a subscription service in Australia, but um, they were finding it pretty hard to compete against uh, the two incumbents in the market being ourselves and Neomap. Uh, so we struck up a dialogue with Eagle View and eventually um, we offered to buy Spookfish Australia from them, they agreed. Uh, and so we took over the contracts and the operations of Spookfish Australia. Um, we've continued to maintain a dialogue with Eagle View uh, since, and uh, yeah, we're quite interested in what they're doing in the United States. And, and um, likewise, they're very interested in what we're doing in 3D. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, continuing to compare notes uh, so, yeah, that dialogue is, is ongoing and uh, we have a very uh, good relationship with Eagle View. Okay, uh, next one, Mar uh, Mark. Uh, investing cash flow has been elevated in recent periods, um, presumably due to purchasing things like cameras, but uh, they say also intangibles, but I think you alluded to the, the, the work you have to do ahead of the, the subscription model. Uh, can you give a comment on what same business capital requirements are? Uh, yeah, uh, look, we'd be uh, hoping to get to break even point pretty soon uh, on the Metro Map program. The other project services pay for themselves and, and return um, return free cash to the to the company. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, the stay in business capital. Yeah, look. I think that uh, Aerometrics has always been self-sustaining up until the time we listed. We had to make that investment in the subscription uh, service uh, ahead of the game, but uh, you know we're rapidly closing in on our cost base. And uh, once we get past that, uh, most of that revenue goes to the bottom line. Okay. And then just a question from me, Mark, in terms of the subscription base, um, do the subscribers, do they pay monthly? Is it a 12 month license, a mixture of both? Um, depending on the customer, you know, I'm thinking, you know, yep. governments, annual budgets, they might like to pay for a year, corporates maybe month to month because they're working on a four or five month project and that's all they need access for. Maybe just give us an idea of how it actually works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. So we have uh, we have been flexible on this. We've been aiming to listen to our customers and meet them at their point of need. So you know we would like to sign all our customers up to three year deals. That would be great. Um, a lot of our customers are not in a position to do that for one reason or another, and so we have been flexible. We've offered annual contracts or even monthly contracts um, where that uh, that suits them best, uh, but. You know, our aim is to demonstrate the value in the product. And, you know, we find that a lot of uh, people who have initially taken out a, a one year uh, contract or a monthly contract go to a longer uh, time frame as well. Okay. Mark, we're just up on time. And I know Dan has joined us from Perth. So I think we'll just leave it there and um, contact details for. 
Aerometrics and Mark have been up on the slide there for anybody who wants to get in touch. And I'll just say thank you to Mark for, for joining us uh, this morning. Mark, if you could please stop sharing your screen and then we'll hand over to Dan. Dan. So, Dan, if you want to, yeah, it's coming through now. And just go to, yeah, full screen mode. There we go. Okay, you're ready to go, Dan. Uh, you just need... right. Yeah, uh, we can hear you now, Dan. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Mark, and good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for the uh, opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate your interest and your time. Um, I intend to give a short overview of um, Joyce and our businesses, and then talk about the the recent training results and some more detail for the two businesses. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the story, this is is an introduction and uh, some metrics um, on our, our recent trading results. And then hopefully there'll be time for questions after, after. so I'll try and make sure I leave uh, a good uh, five to 10 minutes for that. The uh, usual disclaimer is, is on there. The vast majority of this presentation is prepared from uh, what has been submitted to the ASX on the uh, half year results uh, with some introductory slides as well to talk to with regards to um, uh, our two businesses. We're a fast growing group that's seen significant revenue growth from our businesses and partners, uh, resulting in a history of strong dividend stream and capital growth. We partner with quality small to medium Australia businesses that have a strong potential to grow and to establish themselves as market leaders. And our aim is to deliver above average returns from both capital appreciation and dividends. And we're well established to do this with a, a sound platform from organic growth and being well positioned to take advantage of other external complementary opportunities. And I'll talk about the, uh, the organic growth opportunities and the businesses that we have. Uh, what you see here is um, the uh, investments that we have and the flow of the economic interest into Joyce shareholders. Um, this is uh, an attempt to be a simplified model to uh, just, just give you an idea of, of how that um, flows into the underlying uh, value for Joyce. We have a 51% uh, majority interest in a business called the KWB Group, um, and the net profit attributable to Joyce shareholders flows through from our, our interest in there. Um, it's consolidated in our accounts. Uh, we have 24 showrooms across the country for that business, and I'll give you an overview of that in a moment. We also have a 100% ownership uh, of the uh, Bedshed brand. Um, that is primarily a, a franchise operator. Um, and we have 33 stores that provide franchise fee income to us. Uh, and we also have uh, an ownership of some company stores. Um, so that's just direct uh, trading results. That flows into the Joyce Corporation, which is uh, listed on the ASX. Um, we also have uh, property in um, Perth, uh, which is uh, owned 100% by Joyce, which is circa five and a half million dollars, which underpins the balance sheet in addition to the net cash that we have that at 31st of December was $12.7 million. Uh, we have uh, available franking credits and have always paid uh, fully frank dividends. Um, and we also have an investment property held uh, as a 51% interest in KWB uh, that sits at approximately $10 million. So a strong balance sheet. Brief overview of the businesses and I'll return to these in more detail later on. Um, the KWB Group operates the Kitchen Connection, Wall Span and Wardrobe Connection brands. Uh, it's a leader in Australia's uh, home renovation market, uh, the renovation market. Um, we target Do It For Me uh, and look for the uh, full experience from the design to the uh, installation. There's 24 sites under the, uh, the brands. Kitchen Connection sits in Queensland and uh, New South Wales and the uh, Wall Span brands are in South Australia. Um, we've expanded quite rapidly and we probably sit at just over 30% of Australia's population in terms of uh, where our stores are at the moment. As I say, I'll return to uh, the KWB group uh, later on. Bedshed, um, uh, established uh, Australian household name, good brand loyalty, good strong customer base. We've been in business for over 40 years. 
uh, and as I say, 33 store uh, network and four company owned stores. This has been a consistent performer for the Joyce Corporation and is uh, delivering ongoing improvement uh, across our network as the uh, brand becomes more prominent um, and more importantly, as the franchise network expands its footprint. So I just focus on uh, some operating results. This is from, as I say, the half year, but it gives you a good idea of uh, some of the metrics. We've had very uh, robust consumer demand and higher sales levels um, that's uh, converted to strong earnings growth across all businesses in the group. That's gave us, given us a significant uplift in our cash position, profit and dividend for the first half uh, of the financial year um, that we're currently in. Um, we have a streamlined company structure following the finalization of the divestment of Lloyd's online auctions, which was a business that we held for approximately four years, I believe. Um, we have $3.3 million received from that, but importantly, what that's allowed us to do is to focus on the operational excellence of our two well-established fundamental businesses, which are KWB and Bedshed, that consistently perform and have great uh, organic growth potential. We paid a record uh, fully frank dividend. We've got a good history of paying dividends. Uh, we paid seven cents from uh, approximately five million of net profit after tax attributable to Joyce shareholders. And we're targeting a full year dividend payout ratio of 60 to 80% of NPAT, looking to deliver a steady increase over time. And I think that the businesses that uh, we have in the portfolio at the moment are very well placed to deliver on that. We were able to return JobKeeper of $1.4 million, um, consistent with our core values. JobKeeper played an important role in allowing us to continue our business and maintain our staff through the uh, initial phases of the COVID pandemic. pandemic. Um, and that was in the uh, latter half of last financial year. But given the rebound in the business performance during the first half of the current financial year, we felt that the right thing to do was return the funds to taxpayers. Um, we announced that we would do that in January, uh, sorry, February, and uh, we're just in the process of actually making that payment to the ATO, uh, just finalising the, the tax treatment. But that was very important to us to, to lead with that, be consistent with our values, and I think that has set us apart from some of our peers and some of the other retail trading groups, which I'm sure you'll be aware of. We've seen a significant increase in returns to shareholders from both capital appreciation and quantum of dividend payment. And I think that a lot of that is driven by uh, the simplification of, of the story, uh, allowing the two businesses that we have to speak for themselves. Um, and uh, also the revenue growth that we're seeing through the business being driven by the two businesses uh, that we hold, particularly KWB, which, which I'll talk about. Uh, you can see the share price graph there on the right hand side, currently sitting at around $2.50 and we have uh, 28 million shares on issue. So that values us uh, at circa $70 million market cap. Our intention with the full year dividend is that the final dividend payment will take us to a payout ratio on full year profit um, of circa to 60 to 80% of normalized NPAT. We paid 50% of normalized NPAT on the first half year. So that effectively will be a full year NPAT dividend calculation from that within that ratio that uh, is 60 to 80% anticipated. Uh, and then we'll obviously uh, deduct the uh, interim dividend that was paid from the, the half year profits. Um, and, uh, you know, look, we're, look we are um, uh, seeking to increase, uh, increase those dividends in dollar terms and as a payout ratio over time. And I think the consistency of the business and the growth in the businesses will, will allow us to do that. Uh, just turning to the uh, key results here, um, there have been multiple highlights across the businesses with improvement in key metrics uh, across the board. Um, the, the ongoing trend of, of revenue growth, which we've seen, and I, again, I'll show you in, in a moment from the two businesses, um, has, has particularly been high, you know, as we've uh, seen that strong consumer demand um, with people not traveling. I think most of you will be aware of that in, in the retail space, um, selling beds and bedroom furniture uh, and uh, the kitchen renovation space has been a, a fantastic place to be in. So we've, we've taken advantage of 
the very strong uh, headwinds that we've seen. But importantly, um, that's a trend that has been uh, ongoing and is uh, demonstrable uh, from the, uh, the two businesses that we have. Revenue in, in half year there of uh, 52.8 million. Um, positioning for circa $100 million um, revenue uh, full year uh, on the assumption that the second half year continues. Um, and uh, when you look at some of the previous uh, numbers and, and in fact the, the first high um, HY of 20 comparative, I think it's also important to note that uh, there was revenue in there from the, the Lloyd's business, uh, the auction business, which uh, is not in the half year 21 numbers. Um, so that actually, uh, you know, gives a, a higher comparative in terms of growth uh, on revenue. A strong contribution margin uh, group uh, expenses have been uh, controlled and reduced. Um, that's the, the full group, including the um, expenses for the uh, KWB business uh, at 100 percent because these are consolidated into our accounts um, and uh, very strong EBITDA. Um, the number of net profit after tax is um, uh, the number, again, before the minority interest uh, of KWB and the uh, group net profit after tax is circa $4.8 million. So uh, very um, good uh, metrics, uh, as I say, improvements across the board, uh, very solid trading results, and we think we're well positioned to uh, continue that into the uh, second half of this financial year and beyond. Uh, looking at the, the cash position, um, we have a very strong balance sheet. Importantly, that provides a, a good platform for growth, both organically uh, and beyond that, uh, with potential external opportunities. Um, I'll talk more about KWB and Bedshed in a moment, but both of those businesses have very low capital requirements from uh, a day-to-day -day operational basis and also from an expansionary point of view. Um, so uh, that uh, you know dovetails very well into the, the strong balance sheet that we have as well and the ability um, for uh, leverage of, of debt um, for additional opportunities should we wish to um, and of course for the consistent dividend uh, payment and the dividend ratios. As I mentioned, that's underpinned by the, uh, the uh, approximately $15 million of property that we hold on the consolidated balance sheet, 5 million of that belonging directly to Joyce and $10 million of that being uh, a shared property in terms of our 51% ownership held by KWB. Uh, closing group cash there of almost $20 million. We've paid a, uh, I believe it was $1.9 million dividend uh, during the uh, half year, which was the dividend that we declared, but um, businesses have been performing well and uh, giving us a continued strong cash balance. We'll be looking to uh, evaluate the, the debt that we've got there. The facility there um, is uh, giving us a net cash position of uh, almost $13 million. Um, and uh, given those metrics, we're just currently uh, looking into uh, whether we want to carry that debt facility or not. Um, but of course, the, uh, the flip side to that is uh, being in the, uh, you know, the COVID environment, as we know, it's, it's not quite cleared up yet. And there's some uncertainty behind that. Excuse me. So turning to the KWB uh, group uh, review, um, I'll, I'll give some information into the company as well. As I say, the two main brands are Kitchen Connection and Wallspan, uh, Queensland and New South Wales being Kitchen Connection and Wallspan being South Australia. You can see there how the, uh, the number of stores are uh, positioned. Um, we started off in Queensland and I believe it was 2014. Um, we have uh, opened approximately uh, four stores per annum. Uh, we currently have 24 showrooms uh, across uh, those states. And we've recently expanded into New South Wales uh, and more so into the, the Sydney regions. Tweed Heads, Tuggera, Castle Hill and Ataman have all opened in the last 12 months. Um, we have Bellrose and Penrith in the pipeline for opening later this calendar year and then expansion into Southern Sydney to follow into 2022 uh, and some of 2023. And then uh, obviously Victoria is an untapped market as well. Um, we expect to have a sort of run rate. Um, typically we've been around four stores per annum. 
Um, and from what we've seen in, in Sydney um, so far, there have been uh, very, very strong orders and sales almost straight from opening. Uh, and our payback uh, period, therefore, has been reduced significantly. But as I say, these are, these are relatively low capital intensity businesses. Um, and, and I'll talk about that, that business model um, uh, uh, right now. So, uh, as I mentioned, we target the, uh, the do it for me renovations in the in the middle market space. So, so not the high end, and certainly not in any way the uh, the more basic um, you know um, type of product that you'll see in, in Bunnings and IKEA. Um, we are the the leader in the home renovation market, and in this in this space, it is a it is a large market to tap. Um, we deliver the full design um, uh, to uh, from renovation um, and the, the full experience into installation. Um, we operate showrooms, so uh, as a retail, there's a retail touch point there for the, the customer to come in. We also do um, obviously online marketing um, and um, bringing customers through uh, through the web and then bringing them into the showrooms. We build that into um, the the design appointment, the design of the kitchen, and then we manage the project the product range and we manage the scheduling of the the installation. We do that through deposits from the customers. So we have a large proportion of the deposit down uh, and then the, the product is uh, manufactured and installed. And we manage that, that overall project with a, a customer service manager um, and put that into obviously installation and close out that work. Um, we pride ourselves in uh, our excellence in service and the, the superior quality products uh, and finishes. Um, and that um, basically um, is, is evidenced by the fact that the business has kitchen rework costs of less than 1% of total revenues. Um, that really is um, a market leading um, statistic and obviously has a significant financial uh, impact for us as well in, in a positive way. Um, the, uh, the whole process there basically, um, you know, is, is about creating referrals, uh, which is, is our mission. And that's how we get uh, the large proportion of our, our customer base and why we've hit Sydney so strongly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's demonstrated in terms of the, the strong brand and the uh, exceptional customer experience that comes from those referrals and comes from our, our business model is, is demonstrated in, in our rating and our reputation from excellence. Um, we have uh, very high um, ratings on independent review service sites. Um, we only have uh, registered customers who can go onto those sites. Um, we have you know, significant number of reviews and, and this is a product review uh, website, as I say, the independent website. Um, and these numbers of people that, that come through here are, are, are quite substantial and uh, you know, very, very good results outperforming the, the, the major peers. Um, and that just demonstrates that the, the business model works. As I say, it's all about the, the referrals. And it also it, it has um, been done over time with an expansion of the network um, from, you know, circa 10 stores if, a few years ago to 24 now. And as I say, uh, circa four per annum uh, ongoing. So there's a, there's a very successful history of rolling out this business model and increasing revenue from this uh, with very strong uh, uh, margins and results as well. With regards to the, uh, the margins and results, this just shows from December 16, um, that dotted blue line is, is the revenue trend. What you're seeing is the half year periods on here. Um, so the results for that half year. Um, and you can see that that revenue trend has continually um, improved consistently. Um, net profit uh, before tax from half year results as well is, is exactly the same. Um, the revenue uh, for the half year of 41 million compared to 36 million in the comparative half year. And that includes some of the, the, the COVID interruption that we had in uh, July primarily of, of this year. And, um, uh, you know, again, very, very, very good results. Um, very good um, trading from our new stores and, and across our network. Um, growth uh, in, in margin as well. Um, as we've improved our efficiencies and increased the margins as the business model is continually refined and, and expanded. Um, and with regards to the current uh, half year um, into the end of this financial year, 
We've had um, a, a very strong order book, um, which converts into revenue, usually in a lead time from obviously when we get the order into when we install the kitchen. Um, as I say, there are, there are customer deposits that come in along the way, which manages the cash flow of the business, but the revenue recognition comes in when the kitchen is installed. So that strong order book that we've seen for this uh, half year, um, you know, bodes very well for the financial results uh, from this half year in terms of turning into revenue. Turning to uh, Bedshed, um, there's been, um, again, significant growth across the franchise and the company owned operations. Um, we uh, basically sit um, uh, across Australia. Um, we were originally established in WA um, over 40 years ago. We've got 37 stores now um, uh, across Australia with um, four of those being company owned. The franchise model is uh, the model that we are, are pursuing um, and have been um, actively focused on. Um, we're currently establishing a New South Wales presence um, after COVID interrupted our strategic plans in that regard. Um, that one store that you see there is actually in, in ACT, um, but we are developing a pipeline of, of franchisees um, into the 2021 calendar year with a particular focus on Sydney Regional and, and Metro um, Sydney. Um, we've established as part of that strategy an e-store in New South Wales um, that is, is now uh, trading. Um, and that will uh, you know, be accompanied by uh, brand marketing and awareness into the Sydney market ahead of uh, franchisees coming into the, the market, uh, which helps franchisees obviously hit the ground running uh, it's not a direct competitor um, to the franchisee operations because it's uh, an e-store um, without a, a physical you know, shop front or premises. Um, and uh, basically, as we try and bring new franchisees into the network, we're lining up franchisee agreements. We're lining up lease um, uh, in the right locations uh, for those franchisees. And of course, they also need um, stock to be able to open uh, and trade when the, the lease and the agreement comes together. So having a, an e-store there is also an opportunity to uh, provide stock and product into the new franchisees. And, and when we have an established network, we can you know, potentially take a step into the background from that, that e-store, which is a, a lot lower cost to establish into a new area. Uh, time will tell how that um, strategy comes off, but at the moment I'm very pleased uh, with the way that that is, is working and looking, um, and I would be uh, hopeful of giving an update to the market on uh, that planned pipeline of franchisees uh, into the Sydney region and the metro area uh, shortly. So uh, we have a very strong franchisee model, as I, as I mentioned. Um, there is strong engagement. We think that's a real point of difference uh, with the way that we operate. Um, there is uh, evidence by the uh, one franchise store being up for resale in nine years uh, and many franchise partners in the network since the 1980s. Um, we, we have a, a strong involvement with them. We um, obviously run the marketing, we assist with the store layouts, the evolution store fit outs, uh, bringing new product to the market, training in terms of sales, stock management, and some of the systems that they use as well. Um, and uh, that's uh, one of our more recent stores in the top right hand corner there in, in Melbourne, one of the, uh, the franchisee stores. We've also recently launched a new brand campaign, um, which is um, Authentic Bedroom Moments, trying to position ourselves as <clears throat> whole of bedroom experts, but most importantly, continuing the evolution of the brand awareness and, and longevity uh, of the customer. So not pushing direct product, but really building a, uh, a you know, an, an emotional attachment. And we've had very good success in the last two or three years from our marketing campaigns in terms of being recognized for them and, and awarded for them, uh, and also uh, getting market share. Both the franchising and company owned store businesses performed very strongly in the first half of the 2021 financial year, uh, as I say, backed by uh, effective advertising campaigns. Uh, combined operations revenue and, and net profit before tax grew by 36% and 200% uh, percent respectively. The franchising operation more than doubled its uh, net profit before tax. Um, and uh, the company stores, which uh, in times of uh, high demand, 
um, you know, will always do very well. Um, also contributed, uh, you know, exceptionally well to the, to the overall results. Uh, so you can see there that we had uh, approximately uh, $4 million of, of revenue in, in the half year from those that franchise uh, and company stores. Uh, and we've had uh, an increasing um, revenue trend uh, and net profit before tax. As of course we um, grow that franchise network, um, the margins improve um, and uh, you know, it's, it's all about uh, a scale, but of course there's, there's relatively low cost underneath that being in the franchise model. Um, we were well positioned to deliver stock into the market as well. Uh, and that helped us get a, a good jump on some of our competitors. So uh, looking at the, the growth opportunities and the focus um, with KWB, um, significant potential to expand uh, the footprint. Um, Near-term expansion plans in New South Wales that have been rolled out uh, and are being rolled out as we speak. Um, that will be the primary focus for the next uh, 18 months um, to uh, 24 months. Longer term opportunities, of course, in the untapped states, uh, Victoria particularly, uh, and WA. Um, we've seen growth within our existing stores, further margin improvements. We've seen continual margin improvements as well uh, as the, the business model has been refined. Um, and that's evidenced in uh, you know, what we have is a, a proven track record of growth in, in returns from operational and cost efficiencies and real consistency in what this business delivers uh, and how it's delivered growth. Um, this is the real sort of driving uh, engine for, for the Joyce Corporation in terms of what comes through through that 51% interest. Bedshed is a uh, focus on the franchise network expansion, um, the New South Wales um, presence, which I, I talked about. Um, we're continually evaluating additional states and, and new locations um, and focused on existing state expansion uh, and growth initiatives. The online sales actually were introduced uh, just pre-COVID um, as a strategic, um, you know, uh, as a strategy to complement the, the existing stores. Um, when COVID hit, that uh, helped us significantly with, with Melbourne. Um, we are seeing that that online market does have a, a, a good potential. Uh, it's obviously been leveraged into the um, into the e-store in Sydney, uh, but I think there are uh, there are other opportunities into that um, uh, as well. Um, and, and um, you know we're, we're constantly evaluating that. With regards to the, the Joyce Corporation, um, I've been in the role since December this year. Um, the current chairman took the reins in December this year, having been on the board for you know circa 12 months. Um, so we have a, a refreshed uh, board uh, and executive. Um, importantly, the fundamentals are that we're very well established for growth. Uh, as I've said, consistently performing businesses uh, and partnerships with strong organic growth potential, relatively low capital expansion costs, a very strong balance sheet from cash and underpinning um, property value, gives us a, a very low gearing ratio at the moment, um, good sources of potential growth funding should they be required. We've had a continual um, focus on minimizing the corporate costs and uh, looking at uh, making sure we're appropriately structured for what we currently uh, sit in with regards to the environment of our businesses and externally, but also where we, we want to be placed and where we want to go. There's a corporate strategic review underway at the moment. That immediate focus is on the organic growth opportunities, which I think we've, we've grabbed hold of quite well and are well, in the, well, in, um, well into the, uh, the execution of. Um, we are currently looking at the renewal and refreshment of our strategic objectives. Uh, obviously, we, we can be seen as, a, as an investment company um, and uh, there are different uh, you know, positions to play as an investment company from a passive minority interest to more, a more active um, ownership or majority interest. Uh, and as those um, interests increase, the, uh, the economic value and the valuation becomes uh, you know, easier to see. Um, the complexity of how many investments we have is also something that we need to be very mindful of with regards to being, you know, a sub hundred million dollar market cap. 
Um, it's good to be able to get, um, you know, you here and listening to this story, but, uh, you know, it is challenging being in that sort of space that we're in, uh, but therein lies the, the opportunity. Um, so we're in that process at the moment and we expect to communicate that uh, review of that outcome to investors shortly, certainly with the financial results or before the AGM. Uh, this slide is, is on our half year presentation, just shows the um, top 20 shareholders, that's what was last published, um, and the board of directors and the key management personnel. I can see that time is, is, is running out, so uh, references again are, are on the, um, the ASX half year results. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up there and leave just enough time for a, hopefully a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Dan, we can take a few questions if you've got, if you don't mind running over by five minutes. Not a problem at all. Okay, great. Listen, there's probably three questions here that we can condense into one. Um, I think you mentioned your opening remarks about acquisitions and kind of towards the end there as well. Um, in terms of acquisitions, I mean, is it kind of bolt on to the existing two businesses or could there be like a, a third leg division to the, to the stool, uh, if we can say that to kind of, you know, grow out the, the kind of size of the operation? Um, look, I, th I think that, um, you know, when you, you look at the, 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 more, the most recent acquisition, which is, you know, was Lloyd's online auctions, there's quite rightly been some questions and sort of, well, how, how does that really fit into the model and, and what's the, the natural fit? Um, and, um, you know, we're looking to uh, really try and streamline our strategy and have some some natural um, uh, bolt-ons, uh, should we say, into into the uh, the portfolio in terms of what our um, uh, our remit will be in terms of where we look. So we want some synergistic um, fits um, and something that makes sense to to investors. Um, you know, I think that having um, a reliable and predictable um, strategic approach with a focus and commitment to our existing businesses and the foundation of growth and something that obviously, um, you know, uh, adds into that and doesn't complicate the message further. Um, I think that's where, you know, that's where our mindset is in the moment with regards to comparing that to where, you know, maybe things have previously been, which have been more sort of opportunistic in terms of um, investments. Um, it's hard to give, you know, direct um, output when we haven't finished the strategic um, review yet. But from a, as I say, from a, a spectrum of being, you know, opportunistic, um, more varied investments from a wider field with potential passive investment stakes to being up the business model continuum curve and being more um, aligned in the same sort of swimming lane, if you like, in terms of what those investments um, are. Are, and in terms of having a, a more um, significant stake and potential, you know, even um, pathway to, to ownership, um, we're sort of in our mindset more on that, that right hand side further up that curve um, in terms of what we're looking for. I appreciate that that's a little bit of a, um, a convoluted and not overly clear answer. Um, but as I say, we're working through that at the moment and we'll put that out to the market. But it's very important to us that there's a, a very clear strategy to the market. Um, KWB is a, a fundamental asset to us. Um, we need a compelling reason to, uh, you know, use our capital to, to buy something, um, you know, uh, beyond that, that needs a very clearly articulated strategic vision um, and an acquisition and, and growth parameters, basically. Okay, and, and yeah, so just we're not rushing more. out to buy something. I should, I should just uh, say, you're not going to see a, a Lloyd's auction, you know, part two in the next uh, couple of months. Yeah. Okay. Um, just on KWB, um, where do you see it going geographically over the next five years? I think you've kind of touched on this in your presentation, but it, would it be fair to say you'd like to have a, a solid national presence across? you know, all the major metros and, and let's say some of the larger regional centers um, at, a, at a sustained kind of expansion pace that's not, you know, running before you can walk kind of thing. 
Yeah, look, that that's certainly um, the, the the aim here, and uh, the, the the brand is is very well positioned to do that. You know, as is the the business model. Um, you know, we've started off um, primarily based in in Brisbane, and also there was some op- there's some um, stores in South Australia that came with the um, the acquisition of the business, which had gone into administration. Um, we'd expanded down the east coast and now into Sydney, so there is a north to south, you know, footprint uh, expansion. Um, you know, Melbourne is certainly, and Victoria is something that that would be next cab off the rank. Um, you know, naturally from from New South Wales, obviously WA has some, some opportunities. Um, you know, there's always a balancing of you know maintaining the quality of what we do. Um, and maintaining, and importantly, you know, that those customer referrals, which is a real strength to the brand, we've done that very, very well. So we do need to make sure that we don't push that too hard and, and put that into, you know, damage that in, in any way. And you compare us to Freedom and Good Guys, which are the other larger, you know, models that operate like this. And, and we do do very well against that. Um, and, uh, you know, but there is also, you know, with that, there is also once you hit a certain scale, can you, uh, you know, expand more rapidly. So that's something that in that sort of, um, you know, two to five year time frame, um, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, as well. Because um, obviously, as a business grows, the, the systems grow and the structure of the, the, the people within the business um, also changes and grows with that. But um, from a capital you know, investment, there's nothing really that holds us back with an expansion of, of that business because the new store uh, set up, fit out um, and training is, is not significant um, with regards to, to how they, they um, generate revenue and profit. And a final one, um, how have you successfully navigated the logistics challenges over the last 12 months, you know, balancing investing in stores, uh, capital management, um, I think they're, you know, saying, you know, a lot of retailers did really well kind of in peak COVID periods, but, you know, have suffered hiccups recently as, you know, that supply chain disruption has really um, come to bite uh, in terms of stock and, you know, just having stuff available in the right places at the right times. Yeah, look, I mean, that, 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 that is a challenge, um, you know, moving into new, because the retail is very, you know, hot at the moment, moving into new premises and finding the right premises is, is an ongoing um, challenge for, for both businesses, more so with a larger footprint business uh, like, like Bedshed. Um, but, you know, there are opportunities that are there with regards to um, product management. Um, one of our, our pillars in, in Bedshed, that is that we will, uh, you know, we pride ourselves on having the, the stock available or certainly a much shorter lead time than, than our competitors. And that's something that we, you know, push very hard and are aligned with, with our franchisees. That actually really allowed us to take advantage early on in COVID because when we, um, you know, came out of COVID, particularly in WA, we had a lot of stock and were really able to, to, to get a jump on a lot of our competitors. And, and in those sort of environments as well, you, you see your margin improvements, but we have held that throughout the, uh, you know, the last um, 12 months of, of trading and, and have managed um, the, the stock side of things uh, very well uh, in, in Bedshed. Um, with regards to KWB, um, we have a very strong alignment with um, two producers of the, the cabinetry. Um, there is some good strategic alignment um, with the Queensland and South Australia and a long history of the producer of the cabinetry in both of those states, um, uh, including them, them operating from the, the property that I mentioned that we own, which we have half of us as the KWB offices and half of us uh, a lease from them, a long-term lease from them. They're our sole supplier. Um, they obviously have to manage, um, you know, the supply constraints to get their, um, you know, raw materials in. Um, but we've been a very consistent um, uh, producer and, and they've been a very consistent manufacturer. Uh, and that's really helped us not just in the cabinetry, but really across the supply chain management and also with the tradespeople that come in and do, you know, the tiling and what have you, because obviously when, when times are high in demand, those sort of people, you know, may look to, to, to just get the, the quicker money and the, the higher fees, but because we offer such a, a stable um, workflow to them and keep them so busy, 
um, you know, we've got a very strong relationship with all those subcontractors. So we've managed that process very well so far. There are challenges, you know, Malaysia went into a lockdown um, recently and some of our product in terms of furniture comes out of Malaysia, but we have other sources as well. So as I say, we've managed very well, but um, you know, there is always that, that unknown with, with what we're seeing from COVID. Okay. Dan, I think we're going to leave it there because we've ran uh, a good 10 minutes over time now, but um, uh, still all good, all good stuff. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us early in the morning um, over there in the West. And I will leave it there. As I said, the recording will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow morning uh, about 9 a.m. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you very much. And please contact me um, on, the, on the phone number or email with any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Cheers, Mark.